Ladies and gentlemen, if I can invite you to take your seats, please. We'll be starting very soon. Welcome back. I hope you've been suitably refreshed with caffeine or whatever poison of your choice um, and suitably nourished. We are in that intervening session um, which takes us into lunch um, and I'm thrilled that we have a full panel during the session of five speakers. So we'll try to get as many rounds of conversations as possible. First of all, I have to apologize uh, for having to subject you to my presence again. This time, I am on the other side of the table or fence, uh, whatever your choice of analogy is. Uh, I am moderating this panel happily. And we will be discussing the value of alliances, blocks, security arrangements, multilateral arrangements, again, um, in terms of your choice, and, and its value on the stability or instability, as the case may be, of East Asia. And to help us unpack that discussion, I am very pleased to be joined by the following speakers in no particular order. So I believe we have three speakers um, joining us online if we can perhaps beam them on the screens. Excellent. Hello, everyone. Good to see you. I, I wish you were with us here on the table, but it's good to have you on screen. Um, and so Tobias Harris is Deputy Director and Senior Fellow Asia Program at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Jeremy Paltiel, right next to me on my right, is Senior Fellow, Institute for Peace and Diplomacy, and also Professor at Carleton University. Lyle. Goldstein is right there, excellent. Um, Director, Asia Engagement Program at Defense Priorities and Visiting Professor at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs, Brown University. Alice Ekman, Senior Analyst for Asia at the European Union Institute of Security Studies on screen. And to my left, also from Defense Priorities, is Andrew Latham, non-resident fellow um, at Defense Priorities and Professor of International Relations and Political Theory at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota in the United States. Now, we will get straight into rounds of questions and answers, um, and then in the last 15 minutes or so, I will open it up for your interventions and questions following the format of the previous panel. So perhaps I'll start with Tobias. How do you see America's role, um, as well as its security partnerships and alliances, contributing to the preservation of peace and stability in East Asia? Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, of course, it's, it's. I'm sorry I can't be up there in, in Ottawa. It would be a pleasure to be there. Um, but it's really a, a privilege to join this discussion. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, broadly speaking, um, you know, the existence of the United States and its alliances in the region um, have largely been a force for stability. And I think if you look at uh, certainly the, the broad arc of the post, certainly the post-Cold War period, um, you know, as the United States, or particularly the United States and Japan, as they tried to uh, think about what role their alliance should play and, and upgrade their alliance for the post-Cold War world. You know, I, I think um, over time, they, they, I think, arrived at the conclusion that really um, the role of the, alliance, of the alliance really was as an anchor of peace and stability in the region. You know, that, that ultimately the goal had to be stability, which meant that what, you know, thinking about what capabilities the United States would station in Japan to provide that stability, what uh, roles Japan would play, uh, you know, to, fill, to fulfill that role. Um, and, you know, sort of the understanding that, um, you know, if you did not have the right capabilities or if you did not have uh, credible guarantees, certainly to protect, your, to protect Japan, including, um, I should remind you, really over the last decade, um, extending to 
uh, the disputed Senkaku Islands, at least, you know, extending the security guarantee to protect Japan's administrative control of those islands, um, that you invite, uh, basically, you, you could invite um, windows of opportunity for uh, land grabs that, that could destabilize the region and, and lead to broader conflict. And so I think fundamentally, um, you know, above all else, I think there's been a, a recognition um, that the thing that the alliance really brought and really all of the U.S. alliances in the region brings is stability. This was, uh, you know, I, I always think of um, what Joe and I uh, described this as back in the 1990s, you know, that, that the U.S.-Japan alliance is like oxygen, that you notice it when it's gone, um, but most of the time you're not thinking about it, and that that really became um, the, you know, really the, the driving goal, I think, of thinking uh, about that relationship. And I think the, the a final point, I think, just going forward, um, and as we look at, we saw the national security strategy, the Indo-Pacific strategy earlier this year, and the new national defense strategy, sort of a recognition um, that to continue playing that stabilizing role, the U.S. actually can't do it alone anymore, and that it really needs its allies uh, to contribute more um, in the interest of stability. You know, not um, you're trying, of course, to avoid. Um, provocations that, that can be destabilizing, but making sure that the capabilities are there to continue stabilizing the region. So um, I'm going to stop there, but I, but I think, you know, fundamentally for the last several decades, I mean, we've really seen this idea of stability above all else as the goal of the alliance. Thank you for kicking us off with that. Um, Andrew, I'm going to turn to you for your response. U.S. alliances are oxygen for peace and security? They have been. That's the function that they've served uh, really since the sec end of the Second World War. But there has to be a but. <coughs> Increasingly, they're being viewed, I think, in Washington through the lens of great power competition. And that sounds anodyne enough and pretty straightforward. But and it's, uh, it, I think in most people's minds, some people's minds, I should say, it boils down to, uh, well, great powers compete with each other. That's the nature of international relations. Nothing to see here. Move on. But in fact, the framing of it smuggles in all kinds of baggage from the interwar period, the notion of existential dread, deglobalization, the rise of autocracies and revisionist powers. Is that sounding familiar? Um, baggage also from the immediate post-Cold War years, when we had the, the United States, the behemoth, the, stri the, the world, um, inventing the recently rebranded rule-based international order. Until five minutes ago, it was the liberal international order, but it has been sa sagely uh, uh, rebranded. And then, of course, from the Cold War, we've smuggled in containment, and we've smuggled in ideological divisions and ideological litmus tests, not communism versus the free world or liberalism, but autocracy versus democracy. So when we look at alliances through that lens, which I'm afraid is the lens that is increasingly commonly used to look through, you see where I'm going with that, um, what do you get? You get limitless competition, particularly between the US and China. Um, you get uh, a kind of implicit desire to create a global NATO, our side versus the other side, the global Warsaw Pact, I suppose. Um, not only is this just misanalogizing the current moment, but it opens us up to this notion of limitless competition, and it frames alliances then in what I consider to be a very destructive light. Lyle, you've written about AUKUS, and that the, the formation of AUKUS received um, mixed reviews, shall we say, in different parts of the world. Sydney and, and Southeast Asia, there was skepticism of it and what it portends. Can you talk a little bit about how you see the value of AUKUS, not just for the United States, uh, the United Kingdom, and Australia, but for the larger region? Yes, thanks very much. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there uh, to join you in person. Um, uh, I, I uh, have a long desire to get to Ottawa, so I'm sure I'll make it happen in the future. But uh, yeah, sure, I mean, my view on AUKUS is uh, that um, w while it's all well and good to cooperate very closely with Australia, but, uh, um, and, you know, somebody, you know, I worked for the Navy for 20 years. I saw a lot of very positive cooperation with Australia that uh, Americans are very thankful for. But uh, nevertheless, you know, to me, uh, I see all kinds of risks and downsides here. Um, 
uh, not least, you know, there are so many feasibility questions and whether these submarines will ever happen. I mean, after all, the former prime minister said the uh, his, his comment on the deal was there's no design, no costing and no contract, um, you know, it's a problem. But, you know, is, uh, what is the message for nonproliferation? You know, is every country now going to seek to to have nuclear submarines? Uh, they may it may go that way. Um, uh, you know, I think there are some uh, disturbing kind of racial uh, aspects to this. You know, um, here come the old, uh, you know, Anglo-Saxon powers joining up to dominate Asia. I mean, it's just not a good look uh, across the region. Uh, some countries are caught in the middle. You know, Indonesia could become a free fire zone if uh, U.S. subs are surging up from Australia. But I mean, actually, my biggest concern that I laid out in that piece in Defense News, if you want to look at it, was that this will cause uh, Russia and China to cooperate ever more closely in the strategic realm, including uh, in the undersea realm. They already cooperate a lot on, on, for example, UUVs, and they're working on a conventional submarine project together. Yeah, will, will they now cooperate on a nuclear submarine project? Probably they will. Um, how will this impact uh, global maritime security? Uh, will we see uh, Chinese nuclear submarines in the Arctic as a result? That would have a big impact on Canada. I think all these things are quite likely. And AUKUS, um, while I see some helpful dimensions here, I think in the end probably will do more damage than good. Thank you. Let me just uh, prompt you a little bit more. What are the upsides? What are the benefits of AUKUS? Well, I mean, I, you know, as somebody who has focused on undersea warfare quite a bit, you know, I understand the combat capability of a nuclear submarine. So by all means, uh, this um, on the surface uh, seems very advantageous. And, uh, you know, U.S. shipyards are full out uh, and uh, can't build any more. Uh, really, that's where we're at in the United States. Uh, we can't increase capability. So this would seem like an easy out for us, you know, a way to... Uh, increase uh, U.S. maritime might with, with that of our allies together. But um, again, you know, I, I actually executing this plan, I think, is going to be uh, very difficult. The diplom diplomacy is uh, complex, um, to say the least. And, and so I, I uh, you know, I have grave concerns. I wonder if Australia might uh, end up rethinking this. I have seen some positive um, noises, I think, coming out of Canberra as far as uh, re-examining their China policy, which I think is long overdue. It has been uh, extremely hostile to Beijing. Uh, it's gone in both directions, but I mean, this has not helped uh, uh, security in the Asia Pacific at all. Thank you. Uh, Jeremy, we heard in the last panel some criticism, maybe concern about Canada's exclusion from AUKUS, uh, maybe some relief even. Um, tell us a little bit about how Canada views AUKUS going forward and what that means for the greater security relationship between uh, two neighbors. Well, I mean, when AUKUS was first announced, when AUKUS was first announced, I think uh, there was a lot of fear of missing out <coughs> FOMO in Canada. And uh, I think FOMO was a very bad basis on which to base your foreign policy. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, I think the most basic point in talking about alliances is that Canada has had a relatively consistent trajectory since the 1940s of not putting its security investments in the Asia, Asian theater. This goes back to the Second World War, uh, which we've been extremely reluctant to invest heavily in um, any kind of defense infrastructure focused on the Pacific. It's been an afterthought in every period. So, and, and looking at where we're going today, and the, for example, the advisory committee for the Canadian Indo-Pacific strategy that, we put, that the Minister Joly put together has not one person from the security realm or from the military realm among its advisors. That tells me that the Canadian government has no intention of increasing its investment in security in the region in any significant way. So FOMO at the rhetorical level, um, at the practical level, we're not going there. And uh, um, whether we should go there 
is another question. Indeed, and let me, let me take some time, because my real specialty is Chinese domestic politics. Oh, yeah. yes. And uh, reading the 20th Party report, um, many people no noted that the era of peace and stability was no longer put in there as a major thesis. Most of you are not aware of what that means. Actually, the era of peace and stability was put forward with Deng Xiaoping in the mid-1980s as a replacement for the previous thesis, which actually dates back to Stalin's 19th Party Congress in 1952, stating that a new world war is inevitable, which the Soviets rejected in 1956, but China carried forward and only revised under Mao in the later period that it might be postponed. So while it doesn't mean that a new world war is inevitable, the Chinese are saying that a new world war is possible by that statement. They, they say their goal is peace and stability, but it's no longer the era of peace and stability. So I guess that, that in some sense sharpens our minds about what we're talking about on this panel right now. Excellent. If you're tweeting this, I'm not sure if we're allowed to tweet this, but uh, for those of you who don't know, FOMO, fear of missing out, I feel like there could be two hashtags from this discussion. Foreign policy, FOPO, not FOMO. But <laughs> anyway, um, Alice, you also focus on China. Uh, talk to us a little bit about how it is from where you sit, uh, straddling Europe, China, and looking at what's going on with uh, these security blocks and how it affects regional stability in East Asia. Yes, sure. Uh, with pleasure. We've been witnessing something that I think we should acknowledge all is that China has a coalition building strategy. Often it has been said that China is isolated. Uh, clearly, it's not the true. It's not true anymore. Uh, when you look at uh, China's convening power at the UN, including at the Human Rights Council, uh, we see that China managed sometimes to gather a uh, superior number of countries around its position. For instance, on Xinjiang, managed to uh, uh, to put on the side a debate on Xinjiang at the Human Rights Council uh, more than two weeks ago. That's just one example out of many when a joint statement is put forward, including by Canada and about 40 countries, to raise concern about the uh, human rights situation being in Xinjiang or Hong Kong, China is managing to gather sometimes more than 60 countries <laughs> in response uh, and to support its position. Of course, we may say this is just joint statement, but if we look at hard stuff that we've been discussing before, alliances, it's very interesting to really acknowledge that China is developing, uh, I would say, counter-alliance strategy. Some would say coalition building strategy. They are the same. Basically, China today under Xi Jinping more than under Hu Jintao, is clearly positioning itself against alliances in general. You know, it doesn't say that it does, uh, it's not uh, looking to sign any alliance treaty with anyone. It doesn't label its uh, very close relationship with Russia as an alliance, but as a strategic partnership. And China consider, I mean, the CPC, when anyone discusses with affiliated think tanks, they consider that uh, our alliances are out fashion, they are heavy burden, and that uh, it's more in the interest of China to develop alternative uh, strategic partnership uh, in various forms. I know that sounds just conceptual, but actually China has a very clear cut strategy to develop a coalition. Uh, it is based on the postulate that through economic ties, you may also uh, develop uh, security ties. And China considers that some of its projects, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, is one way out of others, among others, to develop uh, a network of partnerships. Xi Jinping is not talking about alliance, as I mentioned. He's talking about enlarging its circle of friends. And again, I wouldn't undermine China's ability to gather friends, uh, not just by looking at uh, numbers at the UN, but also looking at China's activism in uh, several uh, international organizations, such as uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, but also to a lesser extent as G20 or the BRICS, which are not security framework, but still China is very active to promote its agenda and to... Uh, um, to shape uh, priorities according to its own interest. 
China has thought very uh, deeply about, strategically about uh, forming a new type of NATO in Asia and consider that it's not the way to go. So China has been more vocal opposing NATO. When you look at uh, Wang Yi's uh, annual press conference in March, he clearly states that uh, um, Indo-Pacific strategy is a what he calls the US-led Indo-Pacific strategy is uh, a new form of NATO in Asia, which is uh, of course has a very negative sense in his mouth, and it's which is doomed to fail. It's illegitimate and doomed to fail. So we are seeing now an official opposition of China towards Indo-Pacific concept and strategy and to any um, form or institutionalization of the alliance, either existing or rebuilt or developed, being uh, Quad, being uh, NATO, we mentioned being AUKUS. Uh, and in that sense, uh, China and Russia converge in building alternative partnerships. Again, we may say, well, if China has no formal ally, how can it pretend to compete with a strong alliance that uh, we are all analyzing here? Uh, well, China considered that step by step, not just through economic partnership, diplomatic activism, and institutional activism, but also through arm export, uh, it could uh, develop security ties that, that uh, may be meaningful in the future. And China does not necessarily expect partners such as Russia to military support its, its, its action, being in a Taiwan Strait, but chi China expects its partner not to position themselves counter China's position. And in itself, it, it's quite a big uh, move for China. So it's not just through uh, export of uh, military equipment, but also through the uh, development of joint military exercise that China is hoping to uh, develop alternative defense partnership. We may think about the joint military exercise that Iran, Russia, and China conducted more than a year ago in the Pacific, uh, in the Indian Ocean, sorry, among many other examples. We all know that China and Russia has conducted repeated military joint exercise in the Mediterranean Sea, in the South China Sea, in the Baltic Sea, in, in Central Asia and Siberia, so this is long. All in all, I, I won't give a full lecture here because this is not a format, but I want to here acknowledge that China has a coalition building strategy uh, that is taking shape and that we, not, uh, we should not underestimate uh, because China is not as isolated as we tend to uh, estimate. Alice, if I can just stay with you for a moment. Um, I want to take advantage of, of your Europeanness, I guess, and ask, um, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, and the connection that you've just drawn between Russia and China, is there a sense of alliance revivalism in Europe? Certainly, uh, because as you may know, uh, before, uh, I mean, traditionally there, are, there existed diverse divergence in terms of hierarchy of threat perception among EU member states. Some European member states were perceiving uh, Russia as a main threat due to geographical proximity or historical uh, reason. Other countries were perceiving China as a main threat. Now, uh, given China's positioning towards uh, Russia, which is uh, increasingly disfactor, I mean, incre increasingly raising concern uh, from Europe, you have a convergence of threat perception among EU member states saying, well, both China and Russia <laughs> should be considered as threat. And, uh, and actually there is more, I would say, not alignment with NATO's threat perception, but I think a convergence on that. Uh, issue too. Um, so um, really, in a nutshell, I think China's perception since the beginning of the war in Ukraine has really evolved. At least um, there is greater, I would say, consensus among European countries that China is a threat. And in that context, there is also greater uh, reason for, I would say, transatlantic cooperation uh, on that threat and, and, and also jointly finding ways to respond and, and coordinate response when it comes to sanction, uh, but also uh, to coordination in the multilateral organization. There, is, there are still strong divergences among EU member states, um, but uh, alliance uh, building, uh, alliance, I mean, transatlantic coordination is more than ever uh, keywords that are, are meaningful here in Europe. Great, thank you. Um, 
Andrew and Tobias, I want to ask you both the same question. What does this mean, this strengthening of sorts uh, in Europe of alliances and security block arrangements? What do they mean for US allies in East Asia, primarily Korea and Japan? Let me start with you, Andrew. Well, I think the <coughs> underlying dynamic in both cases is the same. It's radical insecurity and fear. Um, and in both cases, I'm going to say something a little bit um, maybe thought-provoking. Um, in both cases, those fears are exaggerated. What do I mean by that? Well, I think Russia has proven that it might be a menace to its immediate neighbors, but does anybody here envision um, the Russian army advancing on Paris or Berlin? Probably not. And now we switch to the other side of the world, and I think the fears are overblown there too. We forget that China is, in a sense, as a great power, going out of business. It faces a demographic cliff. In fact, it's already partway over that demographic cliff. It's shrinking. Its economy is faltering. Its population is aging rapidly. Um, it is facing geopolitical counterbalancing in the region. It is not, the real danger from China is what happens when the Chinese leadership recognizes that it's plateauing and then perhaps faltering and then perhaps falling? There are some other historical analogies, 1914 and 1941, one could invoke. That's the danger, well, that's the danger zone, as one recently published book puts it. Um, so I understand in both the European and East Asian context the impulse behind this drive towards alliances, uh, but I think um, it's not entirely misplaced, but it's overwrought. Tobias? Um, so, I, you know, I want to concur um, with Andrew's statement. I mean, that clearly, um, you know, when, when and really, <laughs> I was having a conversation recently with um, uh, some Japanese officials thinking about this, you know, and who were somewhat pessimistic about their own country. And, and you realize um, when you look around the world, whether uh, in the, the "Quote unquote democratic world," and but also among their adversaries. I mean, it's it's hard to see um, a country that you can't you know, th that you can't feel pessimistic about. You know that every country, um, you know, whether it's um, economic challenges, whether it's demographic challenges, um, in the case of the United States, perhaps also um, some pretty severe domestic political challenges. You know that, that it's hard to feel um, overly optimistic about the prospects for any real great power out there. And so, um, you know, this is not. Um, I mean, clearly, I, I think Andrew's point is well taken. I mean, this is clearly the, the this straightforward narrative of um, relative power shifts and, and rising powers and falling powers. I mean, clearly, we're actually it's not nearly that neat and tidy. You know that this is this is a much messier situation um, than than perhaps some of the narratives that we live, that we hear all the time uh, would suggest. Um, you know, nevertheless, I mean, I, I think um, you know as Andrew pointed out, though, of course. Um, countries that fear windows of opportunity closing can be uh, can be dangerous in their own right. I mean, I certainly think um, it's hard to feel um, too optimistic after hearing the results of, of China's latest party congress. And certainly, um, when you know, given how power is shifting domestically within China, how foreign policy is going to be made within China, how all decisions really are going to be made within China, um, that you know, and, and how how the response is made um, to slowing economic growth. Um, you know, we've, I think, taken for granted this idea for a long time uh, that the Chinese Communist Party was concerned about economic growth, first and foremost, as a basis of its legitimacy. Um, and if we are entering a world where that's not the case and where whether it's you know, full scale decoupling or, or just some you know, greater isolation of China from the global economy, um, that I think certainly comes with risks and, and certainly um, changes the calculation on the part of Beijing. And, and it's something that I think all of China's neighbors are going to have to live with. Um, just to turn your question on, on um, its head a little bit, uh, when you look at just sort of the impact of the European se security situation on East Asia, um, you know, I think certainly one of the, the clearest impacts, although the implications are still figuring themselves out, um, it has absolutely been a wake-up call, I think, for Japan first and foremost. I mean, I look at Japan most closely of, of U.S. allies in the region. Um, clearly, I think you look, something has changed in Japan uh, since Russia invaded Ukraine. I think, you know, 
personally, I, I think there's something about the the viscerality of the images at the start of the war. I think, you know, watching uh, Ukrainians huddle uh, in the Kiev subway, I think was there was something about that um, that I think really resonated in Japan. So, you know, the, the clearest example, you look at opinion polls that that point to support for uh, defense, uh, increasing defense spending. I've never seen uh, polls showing support for increasing defense spending, and now consistently month after month. Uh, we're seeing that support. And I think, you know, translating that um, into actual uh, effective increases and figuring out what to spend on, how to pay for it. I mean, all of that, all of that still has to be worked out. Um, but conditions, I think domestic political conditions are a lot more permissive uh, for Japan, uh, improving its, uh, strengthening its capabilities. And, and, you know, we'll have to see the impact that has on the regional balance of power. But, um, you know, that is a, a material impact, I think, uh, that the European security situation has had on 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 Asia, and we'll have to see down the road what that what that ends up actually meaning uh, for the regional security environment. Jeremy, there's been a bit of um, downcast coming out of the the twentieth Chinese twentieth party congress. Um, how much of China's enlargement of its circle of friends is disappointingly a model of same old same old? that we've seen in the past? Um, I guess in some ways, I, I take, have a slightly different take than, than um, my colleague, Alice Ekman does on some of these things. And um, I think there's a very big, big difference between partners and allies. And, um, and even in the case of China's near allies, I mean, for example, we saw at the most recent Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization Summit. While the summit was going on, at the very moment that the summit was going on, there was fighting between Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. And the summit itself had no impact on that fighting. So we can exaggerate what China's enlargement of role, roles is. And not only that, by the way, Tajikistan and uh, Kyrgyzstan were both members of, now SCO is not a, um, a defense alliance in the NATO sense because there's no mutual defense uh, requirement. But the, um, the mutual defense uh, treaty organization, which is headed by Russia, does have that for Brazil, and both countries are members of it, and, and the fighting was not stopped. So I think that we should not overestimate as as my colleague on the left said, um, China's capacity to, to alter events or what China's circle of friends um, means, I think it's more preemptive than, uh, in, and, and as Alice Ekman correctly said in the case of, of, of Taiwan, uh, then it is um, a force multiplier. And I think we really do need to distinguish between partners of that kind and force multipliers, um, and so and it's, it's it's easy to elide these things. And as much as also people elide China and Russia, they're not the same in in many many respects. So um, I think that we that the although the dangers have risen, and China recognizes it. But, but in fact, even the, the statements that, that were being brought here about China's fear of an Asian NATO tells you something what they're fearful of. It doesn't tell you what they are, what they are actually um, trying to assert in, of the, on their own behalf. So I think that, that, that needs to be kept in mind. Um, that's my, 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 I guess my, I want to come down to my bottom line, um, is that although the world is dangerous and that China has a national plan to be a power second to none by the middle 2030s, that is a national plan, um, that we shouldn't assert on that basis that China is aiming to be like the United States in every respect, it doesn't there, or that that necessarily means that it wants to um, demolish the liberal world. That, that those don't follow. At the same time, it does mean that the competition is increasing. There's no question about that. China's not benign, and competition is increasing. It, um, but the question is, not, at the same point, to, to, we should realistically 
um, assess what the threats are. And I think, um, I, uh, yes, there is a real danger after the 20th Party Congress that a risk, at least, that China will be headed toward two kinds of stagnation, Brezhnevian-style political stagnation, as happened in the, in the last, uh, uh, most of the last 30 years of the Soviet Union, and Japanese-style economic stagnation. Those are, I'm not saying that these are probabilities, but they are possibilities as a result of these things, and that we should take those in account when we're talking about China's capacities and its relations with others. Lyle, you mentioned the NDS and the NSS uh, a little while ago. Can you explain to us how the NSS posits the United States in the role of uh, a stabilizing force in East Asia as the United States sees it, but also if there are any dissonances between that view that the United States holds versus how its allies perceive uh, what is expected of them through the NDS and the NSS. Uh, you might be on mute, Lyle. Sorry about that. <laughs> the, the new national security strategy, I think, uh, posits that, uh, you know, Russia is an acute threat, uh, but that competition with China is, should take sort of center stage in the strategy. I, you know, personally, I didn't, I didn't see a lot new there. Um, uh, you know, these documents have a lot of words, but uh, I don't, you know, my own uh, quick take on the strategy was it's sort of, uh, we're, we're going to do everything everywhere. Uh, and, you know, as a strategist myself, I, I would say strategy is choice. And so, you know, I, I guess to some extent there is a choice that China is the main uh, issue. But, uh, you know, th that was, in my mind, uh, you know, had been more or less settled already, uh, partly by Russia's failure in, in the uh, catastrophic war. Um, as far as, like, you know, meeting the expectations of allies, I mean, the this kind of discussion gives me a little trepidation. I mean, to me, um, U.S. interests are not simply adding up all the, you know, various interests of allies and putting all together and baking a cake and saying that's what U.S. interests are. That, to me, that's a very wrong-headed approach to U.S. national security and has led us astray in many circumstances. Uh, and we shouldn't forget, uh, you know, uh, it seems amazing that we've already forgotten Afghanistan. Uh, which was a year ago, had us all in stitches. Um, if I can uh, maybe take issue with a couple points from my colleagues here just to uh, spice up our panel here. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'll, I'll even disagree with my uh, defense priorities colleague here um, who makes excellent points, Professor Latham. But uh, personally, as a China specialist who, who uh, you know, has a few decades of work on China, I would say I, I personally don't think we've seen peak China. Uh, I think we're mostly seeing a kind of hiccup that is related to uh, fallout from the from the pandemic and you know China's ultra um, strict policies on there. I think you know wait a year or two and I think uh, we'll go back to more or less a normal trend uh, where the Chinese economy is is uh, widely admired. Um, I, I don't see those trends uh, going away. Um, if we evaluate China from a national security point of view, we should, be careful to divide among capabilities and intentions. And I, I'm one who says we shouldn't, you know, shouldn't deny that China has uh, very impressive capabilities and will have even more impressive capability. That's just the reality I see. Uh, but but intentions wise, you know, China hasn't resorted to force in 79. Uh, just a couple other points. So on the, um, uh, you know, I think when we talk about a counter-alliance strategy, to me, uh, it's an interesting a thesis, but we should see a good amount of restraint in there. I mean, China could be doing much more in the Ukraine war. <laughs> Believe me, I mean, think back to the Korean war, folks. I mean, if China wanted to turn the tide in Ukraine, it could do so. I don't have any doubt of that. Uh, they do not want to go there. Uh, they're using restraint. They are not uh, sending weaponry or troops. They could. <laughs> and, you know, let's not go down. I, you know, I often want to remind people that if we, if we strengthen the quad endlessly, if we alienate China, try to isolate its economy, that we may end up with something that looks like the 1950s. Let's not go back there. And just final point on Japan, um, 
you know, I think threats to Japan are, uh, are seriously exaggerated. And I would uh, caution that the Senkaku issue, you know, my colleague thinks that that's a major step forward. I disagree. You know, that's put us in the Americans in the bizarre position of contemplating nuclear war over a rock with some goats on it. Uh, that's everything that's wrong with U.S. defense policy. We need to be uh, very cautious. And uh, Japan has to be very cautious. You know, Japan can't move itself away from China. So it's going to have to learn to get along with China. And just putting it all on in on deterrence and hoping for the best in the Taiwan Strait is not a good strategy. Uh, Japan's going to have to use a lot of uh, smart diplomacy, not just deterrence. Thank you. Lyle, if I can press you a little. So you, you brought up the Quad. Thank you for that. I actually was going to ask you a little bit about that. You talked about AUKUS. But both the Quad and the AUKUS have very specific pillars um, of engagement, lines of engagement on critical and emerging technologies. And in the long run, coupled with what the U.S. is doing with its export controls, essentially strangling China's access to advanced semiconductor uh, chips, um, do you think it's going to alienate a lot of partners uh, and, and even allies in East Asia, U.S. partners and allies in East Asia, either, I mean, inadvertently, because a lot of other countries are going to get caught up in this um, campaign to, to stop China's access of these chips. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, basically throwing a giant wrench into the global economy, you know, we, we already had a giant wrench, uh, you know, known as the Ukraine war uh, in the economy, you know, so, so that's already caused huge uh, havoc and trouble, uh, you know, massive uh, hardship around the world. Um, uh, and I think this is uh, just going to sort of feed the flames, uh, not how you would lower inflation, in my view. I mean, decoupling to me is uh, very unwise. And, uh, you know, this feeds uh, China's worst fears about containment. Uh, and they will take uh, steps absolutely to, to counter. And I agree that a lot of states will find themselves in between. And, you know, the U.S. will twist their arms and China will twist their arms. Uh, but we'll all be worse off uh, for, this, uh, for this effort. And, and, you know, China was already, I think, hell-bent on becoming uh, more uh, self-sufficient in terms of... Um, its economy and high technology and so forth. So um, this will only uh, feed that determination. By the way, the more we decouple and the more China is self-sufficient, the more willing they will be to use force in, in the Taiwan Strait. So to me, the, the trends are very dangerous, gloomy on all fronts, I'm afraid, and we really need a much more enlightened uh, policy, uh, including to grow the U.S. economy and the Canadian economy. Uh, which, which are you know, quite, uh, still quite interlinked with China, and that, that's a good thing. We seem to have forgot about the, the word economic interdependence is rarely heard these days, but I call me old school. I, I think it's a powerful tool. Such a passy uh, perspective, Lyle. <laughs> um, Andrew, I want to give you a chance to respond uh, to any of what you've heard, but I also want to bring in India at this stage because India, of course, is part of the quad and uh, is going to be caught up in this whole uh, tech competition as part of the Quad. Um, and there have been some differences in opinion of a, and, and of approach between India and its other Quad partners. How do you see um, India's role in this security community building in East Asia? Well, I'll begin by saying my, my colleague is completely wrong. Just kidding, Lyle. Um, India is fascinating because India underscores another reality which I think is hard for some people in Washington to wrap their arms around. This is not Cold War 2.0. This is not a bipolar world in which everybody lines up. The Cold War wasn't really the Cold War the way it's remembered and framed. India has always had an autonomous uh, foreign policy and sort of grand strategy, if I can dignify it with that term. And that hasn't changed. So where India's interests and vision intersect with those of the United States and others, it cooperates. The, and it cooperates in a way that's consistent with its strategic culture, which is no formal alliances uh, a la NATO, for example. Um, but these more nimble, uh, flexible, agile arrangements like the Quad and others. 
Um, to the extent that India shares the United States and others' concern about a rise in China, it's hardly surprising that with respect to that rise in China, India and the United States and Australia and Japan and others will collaborate and cooperate. And it's hardly surprising to me that India will say when it comes to Ukraine, that's a European problem. We got our own. Don't bother us. Which is, in a nutshell, what India's policy has been. Um, so keep your eye on India. Um, unipolar moment is dead and done with. The bipolar moment, either the old one or this one was, well, this one has been stillborn, I would say. Um, it's a very multipolar world, perhaps with three powers um, at the top of the league tables, not Russia, except in the nuclear realm, which is a big exception, granted, but India, the People's Republic of China, and the United States. I think those are the three powers we need to keep our eye on. And uh, India, at least in Washington's collective strategic imagination, often just sort of slides out of that picture. What about Europe's imagination, Alice? Um, because we often hear of Russia, Ukraine, China, Taiwan coming out from various capitals in Europe. Where does India fit in into all this? Well, India is raising a, a lot of questions, as has just been uh, underlined. Uh, it's a strange Indo-Pacific partner <laughs> when it comes to uh, convergence of views uh, on Russia and Ukraine. I mean, there is no such convergence of views, and there is also question about uh, the domestic uh, development under the Modi government. So when we talk about uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy as a uh, group of uh, like-minded partner, <laughs> uh, this like-mindedness is also not easy to, to shape and frame because uh, government are evolving, positions are moving, and I must say from a European perspective, many, I mean, the position of uh, India is, uh, is raising a lot of strategic questions. And, and uh, the concept of strategic autonomy in, in Europe is more than ever uh, on the agenda because uh, you need to, to coordinate and have clear-cut position because sometimes with people, with countries, you think are like-minded partners, convergence is not so easy. But I want to go back to, to, to China a second because I really don't understand uh, one of the points saying we, are, we overestimate China's uh, circle of friends or coalition building strategy. Well, to be honest, we don't even speak about it usually. <laughs> so I think we should first acknowledge it you may think we overestimate it, it's, it's okay, but uh, it, it's really not the case in, in reality. Uh, and I didn't say that China wants to do like the US, China wants to build an alliance. I didn't equal alliance and partnership. I just say it's time to acknowledge that China has a coalition building strategy that is paying off at least at the UN. Well, if you don't consider that these results are meaningful, I, I, I do consider that they are. And I also do consider by reading closely the various uh, speeches that have been disclosed uh, since uh, not the 20th Party Congress, but the 18th Party Congress, Xi Jinping is talking about the superiority of socialism uh, over capitalism and is talking about fighting Western hostile forces, not just domestically, but also abroad. So yes, we enter the competition within the political system. Yes, China wants to some extent to demolish the liberal world. At least ideological competition is there and should be acknowledged because it's a reality. <laughs> it's a reality that has consequences on individuals. I mean, especially I think from a Canadian perspective, you, you had the sad cases of, uh, of, of the two Michaels um, being detained in China. That's just some example, but unfortunately, it's, um, we are not at the end of uh, tit for tat uh, sanction and also Chinese, uh, I would say, response that are increasingly violent in, in nature. So we may discuss conceptual, uh, you know, uh, I mean, we may discuss a rapport de force from a conceptual point of view, but if you look concretely at the consequences on the individuals and institution, yes, uh, we are in, a, not, not in a competition, uh, but we are, uh, in a fight between political system, uh, and that also has consequences uh, very uh, clear on individuals. The adoption of the Hong Kong uh, uh, national security law was a surprise to many of us, including in, in Europe. Uh, I think China may uh, use lawfare against Taiwan. We talk a lot about military intervention, but I think it's unlikely, the most likely is um, lawfare, uh, step-to-step -step, 
move uh, and this uh, has to be a knowledge and I think China Russia rapprochement also has to be a knowledge we have been talking about the marriage of convenience for eight years now <laughs> since the annexation of Crimea it's, it's time to acknowledge that it's much more than marriage of convenience uh, you know you have conceptual and ideological convergence you have joint military exercise yes China could do more to support Russia today but uh, China is uh, importing a lot of uh, gas and oil from Russia and this has a consequence on the effect of sanction. It's eroding the effect of sanction. I'm not saying they are useless, but it has a counter effect. China became the first oil importer from Russia in June. China is exporting semiconductors to Russia. China is supporting diplomatically Russia in various frameworks, including a D20 that will take place. So all in all, I think we should be realistic about the rapport de force. You have a bipolarization. Yeah, it's not clear cut. It's a blurred bipolarization, but it's there. When you look at the UN, I mean, China is about, about to gather 60 countries around this position. Uh, you may say, okay, uh, China has, uh, we should not overestimate China, China's circle of friends. Well, uh, <laughs> at, at least the, the rapport de force is there. And uh, the description of this session mentioned um, security pact with Solomon Island. It's meaningful and it's not the first uh, uh, in the last. So I, I would stay there, but I think we should take China seriously, that's it. Jeremy, you're uh, welcome to respond if you'd like, but we've gone through most of this session without mentioning uh, Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy that we're all on tenterhooks about. Mm -hmm. um, if you, would, would you like to say a little about what we should expect from the strategy as well? Okay, well, first of all, yes, I, I will respond a little bit. I mean, I, I think I respectfully disagree on some things, um, and, but I do uh, deeply disagree on the question of how to characterize um, what Xi Jinping says about the superiority of socialism. Xi Jinping is actually on record saying publicly that we do not intend to overthrow any government. Uh, and he said that more than once. So, uh, and he says that not simply because he's, he, he's trying to reassure people because, he, doesn't, um, because he, doesn't, he wants to fool us, but because he's drawing a distinction from, from the Maoist period uh, rhetoric and politics when that was China's official policy of the a Communist Party. So it isn't, it isn't the official policy of the Communist Party to overthrow liberal governments. Um, and, and so um, trying to, to put words in his mouth on the basis of the question of the superiority of socialism is, I don't, uh, frankly, nonsense. And um, I would say that the, the, the statements about the superiority of so socialism are actually very much in line with President Biden's statements about the, 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 the fight between uh, democracy and authoritarianism. President Biden's statement between the fight between democracy and authoritarianism is meant as aimed at the domestic audience. It is the replacement and displacement of the MAGA, the make America great again. He's saying we are making America great again to be the leader of the free world. And this is meant to convince Americans Largely, um, it so happened that President Putin invaded the Ukraine and some, somewhat seemed to put this, this into a, a greater perspective um, and, um, and did certainly solidify the Western alliance. I'm not, I, and I'm not against it, and I'm, <laughs> I'm for that. Um, but uh, uh, Xi Jinping's statements about the superiority of social is meant to do what is, what is fundamental um, political priority is, which is to cement the hierarchy of the Communist Party and its rule of China against hollowing out and erosion by liberal ideas caused by globalization. And, to, and, and he needs to, he states that in order to cement the role of the Communist Party at home. I'm not saying that, that, th that this does not also lead into this notion that he also pronounces of China providing an alternative for the developing world. Well, guess what? I think they want it. Um, you know, I think this, we've talked earlier about the 70% of the countries of the United Nations who don't necessarily want to live in, a, in, in simply only under the Washington consensus. And so th that's an appeal, but it's not an appeal necessarily. And if you read the resolution on party history, it's almost impossible for any other country to copy China 
in, in actual terms, and, now, and China is not actually giving the wherewithal to, to um, export its way of life to other countries. It is providing aid and state threats. There's no question that it, it is projecting and promoting a state-centric role of development, and that is true. Um, but it's not the same, the same thing of trying to overthrow the liberal order. As far as Canada is concerned, I've been going to take a long time to get there. I guess what I, what I was trying to say is important for Canada to be a good ally of the United States. And I think that we, and, and well, the other thing that happens is, that, is a, a sea change in Canadian policy as a result of the three M's affair, or the, 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 the detention of Meng Wanzhou and the arrest of the two Michaels. And that has led to a wholesale securitization of, China, of Canada's policy towards China uh, in every spectrum. And it's, it, it was a direct follow, and as we now know from the Wall Street Journal, was a direct intention of John Bolton. Um, and, um, and so that where we're at now, and so in consistent with that, we are adopting an Indo-Pacific strategy to show that we are a good ally but at the same time, capacity is not there. Our, our capacities and our intentions are still NATO-focused, Europe-focused, to the extent that we can, Ukraine-focused, and we're not going to be shifting resources away towards the Pacific. And, um, and so that the, our Indo-Pacific strategy will, will reflect those two sides of it. On the one hand, to show that we're a good ally and support the United States. On the other hand, no new resources will be provided to f make any particular um, impact in Asia. At the margins, we will deploy things. We will send ships through the Taiwan Straits in, uh, if, to escort American sh ships, but we will not do anything that is a, a massive new investment. You heard it here first. <laughs> Um, I'd like to invite uh, interventions, questions. Uh, please take to the mic, and I will call on you. Um, but I also, in the meantime, want to give a chance, a quick round robin of responses amongst the panelists to whatever you've heard. Let's start with you, Tobias. Uh, thank you. I just want to go back to um, saying Lyle, to Lyle's kind of attempt to stir things up, which I think I think was welcome. Um, you know, I, I I do think it's worth noting. Um, you know, you mentioned you know, you know the need. You know, Japan has to engage in constructive diplomacy with China. I mean, let's not forget that you know at the same time that you had the Trump administration ramping up tensions with China, uh, you very not even quietly, but you know explicitly, you had a, a Japanese administration led by a hawkish uh, prime minister who uh, spent a number of years actually really putting out overtures to, to China and trying to find a way to put the relationship on stable footing, uh, to find a way to, to strengthen economic cooperation. So this is not something that Tokyo is unfamiliar with and is uh, you know, not interested in. I mean, and I think certainly, um, you know, corporate Japan has not, uh, it's certainly not increasing its footprint in China, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's not racing for the exits yet. Um, so clearly, I mean, there are interests in Japan in preserving that relationship, but it takes two. And, and I think, you know, you have to look um, at, at, you know, Beijing's response to, to Japan's overtures and, um, you know, what it's expected and, and, and how enthusiastically it's responded to Japan's uh, efforts to, to, to build that constructive relationship. Um, and certainly over the last several years, there's not been a whole lot of enthusiasm for that. And so, you know, so clearly um, this is not something, this is not just, um, uh, you know, countries are, are blindly following the U.S. or, you know, the U.S. Uh, has said we're going to have hostility with China and every country has followed along. I mean, I think there are, certainly have been efforts. You mentioned, you know, Australia is sort of changing course. Um, but on the flip side, I mean, you, I, I just don't think we've seen um, a whole lot of interest in reciprocity uh, from Beijing. And maybe it's, you know, they, they you know, think this is all uh, window dressing on, on hostile policies from its neighbors and that these aren't genuine uh, overtures. Uh, but, you know, I, I, you know, we saw, again, we saw a very hawkish Japanese government uh, take this challenge of diplomacy with China very seriously. And, you know, right up until the moment of the pandemic, you know, Xi Jinping was supposed to be in Japan, um, easily forgotten. But, you know, again, so this is not, this is not, um, 
you, there has been an attempt to balance, I think, you know, certainly I think, you know, another U.S. ally, South Korea, has also done the same thing, um, you know, really trying to find that balance between preserving the security relation with the United States, but making sure that uh, it's talking constructively with China. So clearly, uh, the interest in talking to China among its neighbors uh, is there. I just don't know if we're seeing um, reciprocal interest as far as Beijing is concerned. Thank you. Uh, Lyle, let's go to you next. Uh, right. I mean, I maybe just responded quickly to Tobias there, but a few other comments as well. I mean, um, I, well, I mean, I guess I have to ask, you know, if, if a, um, a very, as you admitted, that this is a very hawkish Japanese government. So, I mean, they're taking steps across the, um, across the board to, um, that are ramping up tensions. So if they are occasionally reaching out for a meeting with the Chinese, you know, I, I'm not regarding that as a very um, substantive kind of set of, um, you know, uh, any kind of major diplomatic initiative. I mean, could, you know, could one look over the last two decades of uh, Japanese diplomacy toward China and find a single, uh, what I might call a peace plan? I don't think so. Um, you know, or or maybe just the trimmings of one. Um, I, I would have liked to see much more. I mean, look, I totally agree with you, Tobias, that it takes two to tango and that China has not um, uh, leaned forward here either. Um, so agreed there. I'd, I'd like to see Beijing and Japan both. But I do want to say that on the other side, you know, we've seen all kinds of movement and now um, sort of released by the uh, uh, Ukraine war to uh, vastly increase defense expenditures above 1%, which, you know, I think in some respect may be uh, welcome and prudent, but, uh, you know, um, not to, um, you know, I, I wouldn't like to diminish Abe's reputation here, but he, you know, the last year, uh, unfortunately, uh, before he was assassinated, he spent uh, campaigning under a very uh, hawkish um uh, program, as you know, which when he was not prime minister, but I, as it were, when he was free to say what he wanted, he was able to, uh, you know, campaign um, almost tirelessly for uh, Japan's uh, overt intervention in the Taiwan Strait, which I equate to uh, waving a red flag in front of a bull, literally. I mean, if you want China to invade, that's a good way to get them to do it. Uh, just constantly say how, how Japan will intervene. Um, well, I have other comments to make, so I hope we'll get a closing round too. But just one, just quickly, I want to underline um, uh, Alice Ekman's good point about the marriage of convenience. I, I agree about that. That we've we've liked this term very much, and we have a whole parade of uh, Western experts uh, pointing out the weaknesses in China-Russia relations. But I think often we're missing just how broad and deep the Russia-China relationship is. And um, while I think China has been scratching its head a bit on on the Ukraine uh, war. Uh, there have been some benefits for China, and uh, you know I, I'm I'm worried that that uh, China may uh, indeed look for more benefits here, and may also um, you know uh, begin supporting Russia much more robustly. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, again, if you have any questions or comments to make, please take to the mic, um, Andrew. Yeah, um, you know if. The United States and its friends, partners, and allies act as if this really is Cold War II. It will become Cold War II. And we're seeing some of the sort of precursors to that already, this marriage of convenience. Well, why are these two countries, which have a history, which is not one of friendship and comedy, why are they, why are they bu bu huddling together? Um, partly because they perceive that they have a, a shared interest um, and they face a shared threat and danger. And that is a U.S.-run liberal international order. But it's both the international order that is feared and it's also the United States that's feared. And I'm not saying that's warranted necessarily, but I think that's certainly an important driver here. Um, I will say one thing about the um, much-anticipated uh, Canadian um, strategic statement that's coming up on the Indo-Pacific. I, I haven't seen it. I don't really have any inside track here, but I would be very surprised if there was something, if, there, if, it, if it codified a meaningful divergence from existing policy in broad brush terms, especially around alliance issues. 
What's in it for Canada to get more embroiled and entangled in that part of the world with respect to alliances, military things, that, that aspect of security and strategy? Nothing. What difference could Canada make? If fear is the big driver of, say, nuclear proliferation in the region, um, the only remedy to that is to make South Korea and Japan feel less insecure. I don't think sailing the HMCS whatever through the Taiwan Strait once in a blue moon is really going to make any country feel more secure. Um, so I will not be waiting with bated breath to see what comes out in a week or two. Um, and if it is earth shatter an earth shattering departure, uh, I'll be surprised and I'll send you all an email apologizing for the <laughs> false prediction that I've made. Alice and Jeremy, with your permission, I want to accommodate these two uh, gentlemen over here, and then we'll get back to you and, and then wrap up if there aren't any other questions. Uh, please go ahead, and then Jonathan. Hello, I'm Hannibal Elmotar. I'm a lawyer with McMillan down the road. I do have a question for Lyle. I was wondering about your take that continuing to constrain China is the surest way to move toward the Taiwan crisis. Now, I am tempted by this thought that we can have our cake and eat it too, that we can restore economic relations and forestall such a crisis. But at the same time, we have now the largest Navy on the planet, which is the People's Defense uh, Army Navy. And on top of that, we also know that from history, there has always been a willingness to use force. We've had three Taiwan crises in history, and one of them wasn't that long ago. So I'm wondering, why do you think that we can forestall such a crisis by restoring economic relations as opposed to limiting exports of things like critical resources or uh, semiconductors? Thank you. Please, Jonathan. I'm uh, Jonathan Freed. I used to be with the Canadian government. Uh, my question is very brief as you complete the puzzle of security in the region. No one's talked about North Korea. And if you want to talk about an imminent and potentially nuclear threat in light of recent and current conduct, I'd welcome one or more of the panelists weaving that into their respective stories. Thank you. Thank you for that reminder. Now, uh, final call for any other questions or comments before I get back to the panelists. Okay, one more. A very quick, uh, it's one question with a slight wrinkle just to clarify. I, I'm wondering, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Craig Wilson, a uh, re retired China uh, it, uh, and I, it's set by a, a, a bias, perhaps. My understanding is during the, the from the Korean War through to the, the confrontation in 96, we didn't send any of our ships into the Taiwan Strait. I may be wrong, but it helps me to ask what is the question. Uh, all of the speakers might might helpfully set up. What is the red line on this potential for provocation? Are, do you have a red line? And I suspect you'd have different red lines. And um, I, as part of that, it'd be my red line is, I, I think there's a problem with how much you use Japan as your leading edge in engaging with all of Asia. And I'd, I'd ask even the chair to speak to that as to how South Asia, Southeast Asia sees that. I could be wrong, that's why I'm asking it. To, to, for you to, to address, if you would. Thank you. All right, thank you, Alice and uh, Jeremy. You've been very patient. I'm going to go to Alice and then Jeremy, and then really quick 30-second round, final round, Lyle, you, you're getting what you, you wished for. So, Alice, please. Yeah, I, I want to answer the Canada related question because I'm, I'm not uh, uh, qualified for that. But uh, on uh, one, one line, I believe it's uh, dangerous to underestimate China, the ideological dimension of uh, China's foreign policy orientation. Uh, whatever we call them, they now exist. Uh, we have uh, several signs and proof of, of them. I agree that China does not want to overthrow government. Actually, China wants to support and maintain the stability, political stability of its own government, the Communist Party of China, but also if it can help other countries to other government and parties to stay in power, it will do so because China, the CPC, consider that the U.S. and allies are responsible for what China see as color revolution all over the world. 
maybe sometime with a conspiracy theory view that the CIA is behind everything. That's how they see the world now, including in Hong Kong. They believe that the demonstrations have been fomented by the West, including in Burma, including in Syria, including in, the, in the, what is called Arab Spring. So they believe that to stay stable within China, it's not only needed to resist the influence of foreign hostile forces and to resist any attempt to democratize China, but also to fight back, to fight back and marginalize democratic ideas and values in multilateral organization, but also in general, you know, IR discussion, international debate. That's the reality. And we say, okay, this is just international discourse. No, China if now is supporting several countries to maintain security and stability. We mentioned uh, the case of Solomon Island. China is also exporting part of its of its safe slash uh, smart city structure. Uh, and China is technologically competitive in terms of uh, developing surveillance uh, ecosystem. So there is a competition of political system here. Uh, you may think it's not between authoritarian and uh, system and democracies, but uh, China sees it as it is. And considering that uh, the superiority of one system over another, uh, announcing that has is nonsense. Well, you may disagree on what uh, or the definition of socialism or capitalism, but that you should not disagree on China's um, view of a com of competing political system because it's it's it it is doing this competition and it is uh, happening unfortunately. Thank you, Alice. Uh, Jeremy, you can respond. You can okay. also fold in questions about DPRK and mm. red lines. Um, I think. Alice Ekman and I will respectfully disagree on what constitutes an existential threat. I do want to say, though, that um, as Xi Jinping redirects China in a more hierarchical, national security conscious way, the grounds for trust between China and the West are, are shrinking. There's no question about that. Until China becomes more open, the West will not trust it. That's a, that's a fact of life. And that also means that the, the on a double-sided effort, the, the conflict or the tension over the Taiwan Strait will become more acute if, over the next coming years. The reason is that there's no solution set in the mathematical sense. If China sees mm -hmm. Taiwan as part of its core interests, and we, we in the West see Taiwan as part of the liberal world, there's an incompatibility there. And I agree with Alice Ekman that the passage of the national security law for Hong Kong brought that home. Perhaps the solution set would have been some kind of one country, two systems. But if China, as it now says in the 20th Party Congress thing, exercises comprehensive jurisdiction over Hong Kong, then, which is what uh, Xi Jinping said in his statement, then that leaves absolutely no room for one country, two systems to be a solution set for the relationship with Taiwan. So it's bound to get more acute. The question is, at what level? My, my reading of it, and that is that China will use imply incremental, rhythmic pressure over Taiwan. Um, but my, again, my reading of the 20th party is it a conservative reaction in China, and that China will, be, will not be uh, more aggressive, but it will be more assertive towards Taiwan, but it will be, it'll be a conflict of avoidant where it can. Um, on the DPRK, I think there is an important thing here. I mean, the, the, the uh, mutual letters exchanged between Kim Jong-un and, and Xi Jinping just before the 20th Party Congress um, suggest to me that China shifted its view slightly towards well, more than slightly towards DPRK from being a, a, um, a strategic burden, as it was, was be, they saw it between 1998 and, uh, say, 2016, and now to seeing North Korea on balance, or DPRK on balance as being a strategic asset. Um, that is unfortunate for nonproliferation. It's a, uh, but it is also a factor. We have, we have to read that in terms of the growing, uh, 
bipolar conflict between China and the United States. So you know, take that what you want. I mean, what, what, what we're saying is that this, go what I'm saying is that this going conflict makes nuclear nonproliferation more difficult, not easier. I just want to say that I'm not willfully holding you back from lunch. I do have some latitude from Bijan, who said that we could extend this session by about 15 minutes. I don't intend to go the whole way, but I do want to get the questions that were posed answered. So um, I'll give the panelists, uh, like I said, final quick round of uh, and the opportunity to respond to these questions. So, uh, La, let's go to you. Okay, right. Um, well, let me try to be very quick. Um, but I, I hope that people will reach out to me if you can circulate my email or, um, you know, uh, on Twitter, I'm at, at Lau Goldstein. Um, so let's talk more. But, but I mean, quickly, I, I do think uh, on DPRK, I do think Kim Jong-un is a big, uh, maybe, maybe the biggest winner from the, uh, from the war in Ukraine. Um, let's discuss more. I'm, I'm watching uh, Russia's uh, ties develop with uh, Pyongyang and also, um, yes, uh, as Jeremy said, how, how China is uh, changed, you know, morphing its position. On red lines, uh, I'm very disturbed. You know, I don't think Chinese use the term Hongxian, but they use the term Dixian. Uh, I'm seeing that a lot. I've seen a lot over the last three or four years. And uh, by the way, you know, Putin also used this term red line uh, increasingly after uh, 2018, 2019. And generally, this was ignored in the West. I, you know, I, I think it's crazy. Uh, we, we ought to be very serious about trying to uh, uh, de-escalate these conflicts uh, rather than just pouring more poker chips in and hoping for the best. Um, as far as the question about forestalling a Taiwan invasion through uh, by restricting, you know, China's economy, I don't see it at all. I, and I didn't make that claim that it would do that. Uh, you know, I, you know, to me, um, unfortunately, uh, the reality is I see it. And I'm mostly a military analyst. I study uh, the PLA development. I think China holds the military cards in the Taiwan Strait. Um, more or less, they can invade when they want to. Uh, with um, some assurance of success. Uh, unfortunately, that's the reality I see. Um, uh, nor do I think that uh, we will persuade the Chinese uh, not to do it uh, or, uh, you know, threaten them with sanctions, and that would cause them not to do it. I, I don't think any of those situations are plausible. The best we can hope for, and as an American, I'm uh, hoping that uh, we prevent World War III over this island. Now, there are diplomatic solutions. I don't think, as Jeremy said, that this is impossible. Uh, I think we ought to, uh, that's how we should spend the more majority of our time as experts on the Asia Pacific. We should be thinking through how to prevent both World War III and also a cross-strait conflict. Uh, we, I think we can put our full creativity um, uh, to use here. Um, just a few parting shots. I guess this will be my last words, but uh, we haven't talked at all about Schultz's visit to Beijing. That's a very big development, uh, very important. And I applaud that. I, I think that's a very... This is actually the way to go. Uh, we, instead of going back to the 1950s and having two Cold War blocks uh, stare eyeball to eyeball, I hope you folks reflected on the Cuban Missile Crisis <laughs> and the primary lesson of that is restraint. Uh, we need to break that down at, with these kind of cross-cutting cleavages. So I welcome uh, Schultz's visit to Beijing. That's exactly what we should do. Uh, and I would finally just say, let's let's not make the mistake that we did in Europe by, you know, developing this extremely hostile uh, paradigm and just escalating, counter escalating until we get a war. Uh, let's search for a more kind of inclusive paradigm of uh, Asia Pacific security that doesn't, you know, constantly treat China as an enemy. And let's strive for diplomatic solutions and uh, and peace. And that involves, yes, things like trade and engagement. Uh, so I think, and I think Canada can play a key role. Okay, last word is, uh, we haven't talked at all about the Arctic, but one impact of the Ukraine war is that a lot of Arctic trade will go to the east, making uh, the Pacific uh, Bering Strait more important, and that will impact Canada. So please contact me about Arctic security. I'm working hard on that. It's, it's an important dimension of Russia-China relations. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Um, Andrew, would you like to chime in? Sure. I, I don't even know where to begin. You just mentioned Arctic, um, which the Northern Sea Route and all that, that's one place I was going to go. Um, DPRK is another route, though, that I thought uh, just to answer that question. Um, South Korea is, there's a vibe shift there now. Um, 
uh, opinion polls suggesting that the South Korean people are very much in favor, push comes to shove, of acquiring their own nuclear arsenal. They're fearful of what uh, the DPRK regime uh, might get up to. Uh, that fear might or might not be justified, but it's, it's a real, it, the fear itself is real. And as Thucydides reminded us a long, long time ago, one of the big drivers in human affairs is fear. And how do you allay or assuage or mitigate that fear? If you're uh, the South Koreans fear, there's only really two ways, well three, but one is implausible, we're gonna get rid of the North Korean regime. And the other two is we either have to allow them to acquire their own nuclear weapons. Is anybody in favor of that? Raise your hands. No. Um, or they need their security guarantees, ironclad from the United States. Um, to echo a conversation I was having in a different context this morning, um, the American nuclear umbrella needs to be a bit more reliable. And it is being called into question. And who knows what will happen if Putin does decide to use some nuclear weapons somewhere in some context in Ukraine and what the American response will be and how that then will reverberate through the region in terms of the credibility of America's security guarantees. Um, if I were a betting man and looking at, I'm not, um, 10 or 15 years in the future, I think the nuclear club might be a, a bit larger than it is now. And one of the um, newer members might well be the Republic of Korea, South Korea. And that's my cheery end note. Great, um, Alice, do you have a cheery end note? Well, no, I think Tobias wanted maybe to add, no, you, you had the last uh, line, I don't want to take the floor out of you, no, I don't want to, did you want it to add, you had a chance to say something, Tobias? Uh, but why don't you go first and then, uh, I mean, I have just a final <laughs> thought on the DPRK question, but I also don't want to. Well, no, on, on the DPRK, just I, I fully agree with uh, with what has been said, uh, that it seems that there, there is a, a rapprochement between Beijing and, and, and Pyongyang, and also in the context of Pyongyang alignment with Russia's position, at least voting pattern at the UN, it seems that uh, we have to keep the sense of proportion that, uh, in, in, you know, given the antagonism between China and the US, China sees con some countries who have, you know, who are difficult to manage as, as potential partner in front of this uh, great power rivalry. So I agree with what has been said and I won't add anything else. Tobias. Um, just briefly, because I'm mindful of keeping everyone from lunch. Um, the so t on the I mean I th I think um, just another I think thing to note about where we are with the DPRK. I mean I think um, you know the 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 old, whatever paradigm we've lived in, you know, where North Korea does something, it gets sanctioned, um, and and you know rinse and repeat and do it over and over again. I mean we're we're clearly at the end of that. Um, not least, I think, you know, it's worth noting that during COVID, uh, North Korea basically sanctioned itself much more effectively uh, than any country has sanctioned itself um, by cutting itself off from, from trade. Um, and it survived and it made it through. And so, um, you know, w I think we're clearly at a point where there needs to be a, a massive rethink of, of our goals in, in, in relations with North Korea, a uh, rethink of what we're willing to uh, put on the table as far as concessions, we being, I guess, the United States. Um, you know, clearly, um, this idea that North Korea is going to denuclearize is, is a, I mean, I think it's a total fantasy at this point. And so the question is, you know, how do you, um, you know, how do we live with the North Korea that's going to have nuclear weapons? You know, how do we, uh, of course, ensure, uh, how does the U.S. meet its security guarantees to, to South Korea and Japan, but also recognize, uh, you know, the North Korea that we have now is the North Korea that's going to be there. Um, and, you know, clearly, you know, whether that's arms control, uh, whether that's just um, having some sort of, uh, you know, crisis communications with North Korea, uh, you know, clearly um, encouraging the South Korean government. Of course, you now have a South Korean government that maybe is going to be less interested in this than its predecessor, but, you know, clearly encouraging the South Korean government, you know, to try to, re you know, restore ties, um, you know, across the economic ties, political ties, cultural ties, um, you know, on the Korean Peninsula, clearly there's an interest in that. Um, this is just the new reality. And, and, I, and I think the sooner the United States moves to an approach to North Korea that is based on this reality that the North Korea we have now is the North Korea that's going to exist, um, I, I think the better it will be for regional security. I mean, I think just trying to keep North Korea in a box, clearly that is, uh, it's been a dead end um, and, and it's just time for, for something new. Thank you, Jeremy. You get the final word. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, touch, say one thing about the Arctic. I mean, 
Right now, because of the enlargement of NATO, seven out of the eight Arctic powers are now members of NATO. Um, but uh, that's on the one hand. On the other hand, the Ukraine war has caused a shortage of gas supplies. China's one main gas supplier is Russia, and its big inv biggest investor is the Yamal oil field in the Arctic. So what we're see what you're going to see now is, is in, in some respects, China will be strengthening its relationship with any Russia and its presence in the Arctic because of its needs for secure, at least over the next 10 to 20 years, over its need for securing its gas supplies. So yes, that's, that's, a, that's a reality. So on the one hand, China will be in the Arctic. It already is in some sense. And on the other hand, though, NATO has the, the majority of countries there. What that will mean, I guess that will be for the future to decide. Thank you. You know, we haven't even begun to discuss some of the security arrangements forming around in space, in and around space with the Artemis Accords and all that. Um, but we are at lunch, and I don't want to cause any hunger amongst any of you. Please join me in thanking all our panelists for the insights on really hard security issues, and we will continue this conversation after lunch. Lunch will be served in the foyer. Thank you. Thank you.